one question was posed directly for you. And this was again from Claire. Um, how does the foundation ownership model that Lars mentioned differ from the philanthropist models of the 1800s like Cadbury or Sir Titus Salt, etc.? Uh, and then a further supplement, does B Corp provide the right model of the future? Well, uh, I think it comes from the cooperative models that were developing. And, and uh, we talked earlier about the Quakers as a, as a financial model. Denmark as a nation has never really been having any big industry. It's been a, it's been a cooperative of farmers uh, developed uh, in, in collaboration, uh, dairy industries, developed uh, breweries, uh, <coughs> and, and developed uh, cooperative farms that could invest in machinery. And, and so, so, so uh, the, the difference between the American model of foundation is that we are allowed, that foundations can have corporate interest. Uh, a foundation in the US cannot have corporate interest. And so uh, th the main purpose of the foundation that I manage is to be a stable owner in perpetuity of the industries where we have a controlling stake and to give grants to society in the area of where we are specialists, which is in medical uh, and, and sciences. So that's obviously given you stability and the ability to think in the longer term, as you've suggested. I wonder if any of the other speakers have got some thoughts on, on this. I think you need to suggest which speaker. <laughs> I just, I might just respond on the question about B Corps. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I won't live long enough to see C Corps in the United States convert to B Corps. And there were plenty, there are plenty of examples of companies. I, I'll hold out Patagonia. Patagonia was a C Corp before it became a B Corp. I think B Corps serve a wonderful purpose for startups and entrepreneurs and enable people to kind of lay out the map of what they think as they, as they try to get clear about what does it really mean to pay attention to stakeholders. So B Corp will might be a kind of a, um, you know, a way to, to think that through. So, you know, this is all to the good, but there's nothing to say that legally you have to be a B Corp in order to, you know, put the long-term interests of your employees first, or you know, Southwest Airlines, Costco. No, no, we have I was. Of examples of, of that. I, I would say this is this is a leadership responsibility, and and I think the leadership, depending on the nature of the individual businesses, together with their board of directors, uh, can define uh, what is the ultimate mission that they want to uh, achieve and accomplish. And uh, I mean, we ended up going to this shareholders meeting and changed the article of association of the company because we realized we were getting to the edge of what we could legally do by, by building foundation for access to medicine in developing countries. So we went to the shareholders meeting and said, we need to change the article of association so that the corporation is to be understood as a corporation that maximizes uh, the long-term financials of the company, but with due responsibility to social and environmental issues. And so that all shareholders that buy stock in the company, they know what they're buying into and they know that we would be doing things which are outside of short-term profit maximization but with a view to benefit the enterprise long-term. And any company could do that. George, do you want to come in on this? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think the idea of a B Corp is a perfectly legitimate social construction and it's, it's probably gonna to continue to build rather than wane. But I'm, I would also say, you know, that's often linked with impact investing or companies creating goods and services that may be seen as having, creating specific social good, perhaps, you know, more, um, you know, cleaner technologies or creating 
you know, healthcare solutions or addressing problems of poverty, which is great and people should support. But you know, I'm not sure, and I think, Lars, you said this in, in your own way, for companies that are maybe more in the commit, uh, commodity end of the spectrum, and let's just think of Adam Smith's pin factory for a minute, you know, not every, not every product, good or service is necessarily going to be intrinsic to social impact. I mean, a pin can hold two things together, and that's good. But I think a pin <clears throat> company can still be a very important and a, and a sustainable company, depending on how it makes its pins, how it treats his, how it treats the company, how it generate, how it sources its material, what what types of uh, materials it uses, processes it uses, and how well it serves its customer. And if it does that well, it can often serve its investors. So I think we'll be seeing more B companies, but I think we probably should also realize that most companies may not fit into this impact investment type of classification, but that does not and should not take them away from the responsibility of maining, you know, managing long-term uh, sustainability and, and relationships with both human capital and natural capital. Good point. No, and I, uh, if I may add, uh, I mean, you should not get the wrong impression that we were not competing against the leading pharmaceutical companies in the world. I mean, we we didn't make we didn't make impact investments. We made clever long-term investments, which we could convince our board of directors and our shareholders that would create value for the company long-term. And so it's, it's not like uh, the company developed into a philanthropy. Uh, we ended up becoming a $200 billion market cap, uh, uh, one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world. And you can only do that by competing for talent and competing on the, we compete on the same metrics as all the other companies because the best and the ta most talented people are not necessarily gonna join you unless they also realize that you are a first class uh, act in terms of business. Wow. John, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I, I'm very suspicious of the idea of creating a category of as it were nice company. Uh, because of uh, what it implies for the companies that do not sign up to be nice companies. I, I agree with Lars that um, companies should be about, the objective of directors of companies should be to promote the success of the company. And defining what is meant by the success of the company is a critical part of their job. And that's the way I believe it should be. Yeah, and, and I would add, John, uh... Companies that are that are that are manufacturing and providing services that are perhaps less honourable than than medicine, like making pins, should be applauded even more if they're able to do this in a way which is environmentally friendly. If they are able to create a mission which uh, creates dignity for their workers, and the workers can see that they are contributing to something larger than making pins. Uh, it's far more difficult than my job ever was. I mean, I, I, I have 300 or maybe even 500 people, million, million people with diabetes uh, trying to aspire to treat them all and protect their health. I mean, this is fairly, this is a fairly simply uh, articulated mission to go about, but for ordinary businesses, it's far more difficult. Martin. Um, yeah, it strikes me that this last segment of conversation essentially is about a, ch a change thesis. So we want we want, we want to get to a, a state with a you know a new set of traits of, of of companies. And so one thesis seems to be structure. If we if we have the right structure, we will make the transition best. Um, you know, I'm pretty skeptical about that. I think structure, in my experience, of business guarantees nothing. You you can have excellence within a structure without a structure. Um, you know, I think, I, I guess another thesis is a sort of a telling thesis, you know, tell everybody that we need to emphasize stakeholders more. It seems to me that, you know, telling is relatively ineffective. It, 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 it has some, some impact in that if we all adopt the right rhetoric, the rhetoric may eventually become more than rhetoric, but, but, but not very much. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I guess 
where where would we put our money in terms of a change thesis here? I I, I put it on um, the creation of precedents. Uh, so the Nova Nordisk company is is much admired as, as as an example. And the more examples we have that uh, sustainability problems are actually opportunities, and we have individual case studies of uh, being able to um, uh, to see how that works. It, it seems to me that that you know that is a mechanism for change because. You know, in, my, in, my, in our analysis, a lot of the big ideas in business actually come from businesses. It's, it's businesses imitating other businesses. Um, but not just the celebration of examples. I think that's an important codification agenda too. So it doesn't help so much to know that uh, Lars achieved A, B, and C if we don't know how he did that. And one of the interesting things about pioneers is they often do things but can't fully explain what they've done. So it seems to me there's a there's a, there's, a, there's a codification, because I think it's a different activity, right? I mean, there's doing it and there's, you know, systematizing and codifying how it is done. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a codification agenda. But more generally, I, th I think we, we, we should, uh, maybe another discussion, Paul, would be, um, you know, what is the change management thesis here? Yes. Yeah. But when it comes, it comes back to the, uh, one of the questions which was raised about culture, I mean, I don't, I don't think we uh, in Novo Nordisk in, in a way was trying to develop a fantastic strategy. We, we just did what we thought was the right thing. And where did we get that from? We got it from the society that we are brought up in. So politicians, the political systems we create, social equity has an implication for how businesses uh, act and, and there is, I mean, I'm on the board of a, a large American company and there is stark differences in the, in the societal model and, and the way equity is viewed in America uh, versus say, for instance, in Scandinavia. And, uh, and there are some reflections to, to be made on that, how that influences business leaders in the decisions that they're making. That's, that's really interesting that the, the background culture informs the culture of leadership and the, and the decision making framework.